Good evening, everybody. Thank you for choosing to attend this webinar on Tech Troubles and Wallet Woes. My name is Dr. Kristin Shiborna Murmu, and I'm from Bangladesh. I have a co-host for tonight. Uh, let her introduce herself. Yes, I'm Michelle from Sri Lanka, and we will be your hosts for this evening. Uh, we want to welcome everyone to today's webinar organized by ICMDA South Asia. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to invite Dr. Anita to please say a word of prayer for us. Good evening, everyone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank and praise you for this time, Lord. Thank you, Lord in heaven, that you opened the door for us to have these talks, dear Father, on essential topics. Father, we pray for every single uh, participant who joins us, that, Lord, whatever they hear, Lord, that you be speaking to, into their hearts, Lord, that they will make an effort in their lives, dear Father. We pray for the speakers also, Lord. We pray for the speakers that you will be with each of them and anoint them to speak your word, Lord, holy to each one of us, dear Father. Thank and praise you for this time. In Jesus Christ's most precious name, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Anita, ma'am. Uh, for today's webinar, we have two topics, uh, tech troubles and wallet woes. We are going to hear about tech uh, wallet woes first. So wallet woes, right? Uh, let us think about it. Are we handling our finances the right way? Um, if not, then no worries, because today's webinar is being organized to help some, uh, shed some light on these two areas. Before we hear about uh, to our guest speakers a few ground rules there will be time at the end of the talk for you to ask questions and uh, to raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question at the end of the talk you can also post your uh, questions on the chat in case you do not wish to be identified you can also privately uh, post your questions to either michelle or me please make sure that your mics are mute till the end of the talk so we'll begin with the wallet post. Uh, our guest for tonight is Mr. Matthew Titus, is an avid microfinance practitioner from India, where he founded and led the oldest microfinance association from 1998 to 2014, trained in economics and international development. He has been curious observer of personal finance. From 2016, he has been working to educate young people about the importance of passive income in supporting the pursuit of their vocations. So let's welcome him. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you very much. So um, this is, seems to be quite a topic nowadays, uh, and uh, especially with you know cost of living and everything going up, it becomes important to think about uh, to, to examine how we think about money, you know. Uh, a lot of us have been brought up in very traditional ways. And uh, some of those traditional methods don't necessarily work in the long term. And therefore, as we kind of think about money, I've kind of divided this into three, part, three parts there. The first part is uh, uh, most people believe that it is easy, yeah? And we'll just listen to this audio clip over here. I hope it plays. Monofill Money Extra, I'm Chris Hill. Spending a lot of time thinking about money would be fine if it led to better decisions, but generally it doesn't. So why do we make bad decisions with money? Dan Ariely is a professor of psychology and behavioral economics at Duke University. He's also the author of several best-selling books, including Dollars and Cents, How We Misthink Money and How to Spend Smarter. According to Ariely, a lot of our bad decision-making is fueled by the environment of our spending. So there are mainly kind of two types of ways in which we're bad. Uh, the first one is that money is all about opportunity cost, right? Every time you spend $5 on a cup of coffee, you should be thinking to yourself, what else wouldn't I be able to buy if I spend $5 on a cup of coffee? But the reality is it's really hard to think about. Just, just think to yourself, when was the last time you thought about opportunity cost. You know, money is a wonderful thing, and, and being about opportunity cost is part of the wonderful thing that money is, but it also means it's really, really hard to think about. That. So that's the first problem. Money is all about opportunity cost, but it's hard to think about it. The second thing is that many of our decisions are about now versus later. And when it comes to now versus later, uh, we often make 
bad decisions. And this includes decisions about overeating and under-exercising and texting and driving and, and you name it. So what happens is that we're just not designed to think about money the right, the right way. And then the, maybe the final thing is that the environment around us doesn't necessarily want us to think carefully about money. The environment around us often wants us to spend without thinking. So there's something called the pain of paying. And the pain of paying is the idea that when we pay with cash, we feel bad and we don't spend as much. When we pay with a credit card or um, Apple Pay or Android Pay, we don't feel as bad and we're likely to spend more. And if you think about where the payment industry is going, it's going in the direction of getting us to spend more, thinking less, and therefore saving, saving less. So all of those things together means that it's really, really hard to think about money the right way, and the environment mostly doesn't help. So yeah, that's a good introduction to thinking about money. So, so five behavioral insights, some of which you already talked about. And I think one of the things we got to realize is that our spending of money or our view of money is linked very much to our own behavior. Um, Most of this, like he said, you know, we are forced to kind of think about spending more because of the way it makes us feel. Um, men are especially vulnerable to the spending habit, both in making them feel who they think they are and why small savings do not interest them. Uh, because men always like the big things, you know. Uh, women tend to be smarter in those things. Um, the second is when we look at big decisions, we tend to get overwhelmed. Uh, whether it's buying a house, whether it's buying, you know, insurance policies, we are afraid to demonstrate ignorance. But essentially, we need to learn to ask questions. Just ask the follow-up. Don't, don't, don't worry if you look, if you sound ignorant. Be be brave and don't be fearful of complexity. Thirdly, our fear is reinforced by perception problems. But this is a very critical thing. We lose a little bit of money, it kind of affects us a great deal. After that, we kind of shrink back. We don't experiment. We don't think about it. We just blank out because it's easy to blank out. Uh, psychologists have pointed out that we feel double the pain of a gain of the same amount. So if... You lose 10 rupees, but if you have won 20 rupees, that loss of 10 rupees actually affects you much more than the money that you have made. We just tend to uh, um, we tend to kind of almost double the pain that we inflict on ourselves when we look at our losses. Fourth is FOMO. This is something that young people are completely aware of. Uh, and it's it's actually quite important. And it's, the closer the group that you belong to, the greater the FOMO. Uh, if somebody else is doing something, you make those choices. So, you know, even in church groups, you find FOMO being very, very critical, which is why, you know, um, Paul talks about the influence of leaders and their examples that they set. It's a very important thing to remember that, you know, the closer the group, the more people look up to you, the greater the FOMO that they feel. This is the last point Dan was making, which is delayed gratification. Um, and one of the things to do is actually keeping an amount away and measure it weekly, start on a Monday. One of the things that we do is we start on the weekend. These are simple psychological tools that play to the strength of our psychology. So if you want to kind of start saving and putting money away, it's a simple tool. You start on a Monday, you'll spend less by the weekend. But you start on the middle of the week or the end of the week, you're going to have problems. You won't be able to meet your goals. You'll find that you would have done something that, uh, that you would have spent it on some sudden decision. The other key thing is we tend to be persuaded by complexity. It gives us an impression of brilliance. But if you can't explain something simply, you probably don't understand it at all. And in money, we try to kind of explain things 
in very complex manners. While some of the calculation might be complex, the principle is never complex. You just need to understand what the issue really is in terms of what you're trying to do. One of the important shifts that have happened is, you know, we have moved away from uh, nuclear, we have moved towards nuclear families from joint families. Uh, and that's because of the way the economy has changed, the way we have moved around, the way we live. This is a famous uh, picture in India, from India, actually. It's a hotel that's located in the middle of a lake. Uh, but see yourself and your family and your community group as the hotel. And then everything that you do around with money is the moat around it. You're trying to build that protection around that. Uh, the only thing of money in terms of going up, we never think of the losses that we face when we deal with money. And I think losses are more significant than the gains sometimes. And which is why it's important to protect yourself, which is why the moat becomes very important. This is just a family assessment matrix. You know, um, family risk likelihood of these events happening and family risk consequence. Uh, what is the impact of this? Uh, low, low risk likelihood are holiday, church camps, church giving. That all happens regularly. What is problematic are these cancer and critical illnesses that happen. Uh, riots and family and single parenthood. Uh, and these are very difficult things to deal with. But they're important things that actually insurance allows you to deal with. Uh, while most of the context that I'm talking about is India, I'm sure there'll be variants of that in your different countries. So when you kind of look at uh, the risk likelihood, uh, what we cope and prepare for is what is important. Yeah. So what we recognize in our mind that these things, the chances of these things happening are high. Yeah? Uh, what we are unprepared for are the green and the brown colored ones. Uh, the blue ones are the ones we kind of think around the most. In fact, today you do get insurance policies, for example, that cover uh, the death of one of the partners and cancer and critical illness. But it's a very strange policy because you don't get any money back. True insurance means that you don't get any money back. It's not a savings instrument. It is an instrument to cover risk. And it's very important because in India, insurance is sold to you as a savings, never as a liability that might arise in the future. Uh, in fact, uh, both my daughters complain very heavily because they lose money every month uh, to this term policy that I made them buy that covers both critical illness and, and life. So it's important to kind of look at that because one of the things that happens while the likelihoods are not too much, the chances of these things happening nowadays are increasingly more. And these policies cover you for that uh, so that you don't get stranded in the middle. Uh, the urban life typically insulates us from thinking about uncertainty. Uh, the agriculture life deals with uncertainty nearly almost every day. So the farmers tend to be much more tuned to the principle of uncertainty. It's unfortunate that they are the ones who can least afford to buy insurance. But we need to recognize that these risks happen and that we need to be able to cope with them. Uh, and we don't need to necessarily, you know, the um, previous time the joint family would, would come together, give money and help you overcome these problems. Now that's not there because many people in the joint family are not necessarily earning enough to make ends meet. So it's good to kind of think around these important policy covers. Uh, the other thing to remember, while risk is one important element, and I keep uh, emphasizing that in most of my sessions, we need to understand also how money works. And money works to our benefit if we kind of figure it out and make it do that. One of the magic of money is compounding. And for those who do not understand compounding, it is basically earning on the interest that you have earned. So if you kind of look at uh, saving 4,000 rupees a month, 
and you save it for 35 years, the total amount you put aside is around 16 lakhs, 80,000. 80, but at 10%, you end up with a 1.15 crore. This is just a simple bank deposit. If you do 8,000 rupees a month, then you do that for 25 years, you would have invested 24 lakhs. At 10%, you would have ended up getting one crore. Unfortunately, banks don't give 10% nowadays. That was a previous time. But that's the rate at which you're kind of looking at some return. Even if it's less, it's fine. Um, the other thing is systematic investment plan. And now you can automate this. I don't know if any of you have already got them with the banks that you bank with. Most banks offer them free of cost. Because previously, it used to be when we were young, it used to be only the exclusive big banks that would do that. I would physically fill in a form, go to send somebody or go myself, stand in a queue, so deposit the form. But now you can do it automatically from your own bank account in India. And basically, most fund houses, which is some of the big fund houses, are HDFC, the ICICI, Access Bank, all of these banks in India and the Tatas themselves, they run fund houses which actually offer this service. Yeah. It's basically every, just like that fixed deposit. You're putting every month a small amount away. Yeah. But in this, you can end up with a bonus, which is much larger. And I'll just show you that. Now, this is a step up SIP, which is the last one, which is that you start low. And then as you grow bigger and as you earn more money, you kind of increase the amount. And you can end up with a fairly large corpus. Yeah. Uh, suppose you need this is 3 crore 59 lakhs uh, current monthly expenses are 20,000 present age is around 30 uh, monthly expenses at the age of retirement are 1 lakh 52 and 25 years more you have of working and over here they have decreased the calculation which is its ret portfolio return is 9% which is less than um, and you start with the trick is over here you start with 3,000 every month for one year. Then you increase your monthly commitment by 1,000 rupees for four years. So you, second year it's 4,000, th third year it is 5,000. That's the way it keeps increasing. Yeah, And every time you get a salary hike, increase your commitment. In 30 years, you'll reach that goal. Uh, because 9% uh, is what markets give and they kind of you can actually do things with uh, mutual funds, which are of a vast variety of them. Yeah. Like since uh, many of your doctors, they have even a pharma fund. But you don't need to necessarily stay focused on that because that's the area of work. You should diversify your uh, fund. Many of these fund houses have different things, but just use a general one. Uh, they have these things called the large cap, Nifty 200, you know, which are linked to blue chip companies. You don't want to mess around with others. Uh, Charlie Munger was one of the great investors. And one of the things that he says over here is, basically the big money is not in buying or selling, but in the waiting. And anybody who talks to you about, you know, how they made so much money, it's just a flash in the pan. Believe me, it's a flash in the pan. If it's substantive, it has to be significant wealth accumulation often comes from holding on to quality investments for extended periods allowing time and the power of compounding to work in favor. So basically, you just buy, like they said over there, 30 years, just hold that fund, and that's what it'll do for you. You look at, so this is another chart, which basically looks at uh, held for five years and held for 10 years. These are three indexes in India, Sensex, CNX 500, large cap. And you can end with most of the time, you see 10%, 15%, uh, this is between 10 and 15, and this is about 15. That's how much of a return you can get. 93% of the large cap funds did that. And you can, most of these fund houses, each of the people, you know, whether it's an SBI, SBI even has a fund house. You can kind of just open an account over there. One of the things, unfortunately, is that now you have a new tax system. When we were young, there were provisions which actually enabled you to save tax, provided you did all these things. But I think it's important for us to recognize and plan using all of these things. 
provident fund, housing loan, PPF, tuition fees, life insurance, ELSS, all of these are key things for which you used to get a tax break. Now you don't, now the tax rate is lower, but it's all been removed. I think most of the time they're moving towards a world which doesn't exist in India because in India, people do things only, you know, when we are forced to. Uh, I'm not too sure in the West if they do it automatically. But I think it's a good thing to force people to look at these tax breaks as a mechanism to save money. And I think it's important to get that uh, picture going in terms of what people are planning to do. I've always believed that it started on a lark about investing in gold. It was a bet that I had with an old roommate of mine. Uh, when the present government came in, I kind of betted that they didn't have much of an economic policy strength and therefore gold will just do well. Uh, but that's one argument. The other more important and interesting argument was an uh, argument I heard when I was studying in the UK by, uh, I think it was Jermaine Greer, one of those feminists who was arguing in a lecture at Oxford that gold is one of the best ways for women to invest. Because she's saying, you know, once you have children, your brain goes for a six, you can't concentrate, you know, you can't keep an eye on the index and things like that. Uh, but now with SIP, it happens automatically. You can, you don't need to keep an eye on the index. If it's a big fund, big company, it'll be pretty much safe. But she was essentially arguing that, you know, keeping a track of all these numbers is, is bad. But she said, you know, let's save the way our grandmothers saved, which is buy gold. And this is gold and stock markets over 20 year periods. Um, and you see that when this when the stock market falls, gold rarely moves down. And if you have some few mad guys like Putin and Netanyahu, uh, you will uh, ensure that gold will keep going up. Uh, and also it's, it's liquid. Uh, the second thing possibly that you should try and do is try and read books about uh, the fields that you're investing in, books that you're reading. Um, and I think one of the important things about investing is that you can start reading about stuff that is happening. You know, uh, look at what the issues are. Uh, just reading, sometimes the business pages can be interesting. You know, though it's boring most of the time, but sometimes they are interesting. So start with that and, you know, you can read about different industries if they're attractive. Finally, don't overthink too much. So yeah, don't overthink too much. And I want to quickly uh, draw your attention to, in Proverbs, there's a section called the wife of noble character. And if you kind of look closely at what she's doing, which is in chapter 31, verses 13 to 24, she says like this, she's investing in wool and flax so that the family is not afraid of the snow when it comes. She's ensuring there's food for the family and servants. She's investing in fields and plants, vineyards. She goes to the merchants and trades with them, selling linen and opens her arms to the poor. If you kind of look at each of them, it's the first is like essentially protection against the elements, insurance. Second is budgeting and bargaining. Uh, investing in opportunities for home and food. Opportunity for gains, tithing and giving to the poor. It's, you know, that's what the, essentially the smartest lake builder is uh, defined as a woman of noble character in the book of Proverbs. So, yeah, so that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the talk. Um, 
Now the floor is uh, open for any questions. So if anybody has any question, then they can ask, raise their hand and ask. And also, if you don't want to ask, then you can post the question um, to me or to Michelle. Or you can write it on the chat. Any questions from anybody? Yes, I do have a question. Uh, you mentioned about uh, medical insurance also. Yeah. And in medical insurance, uh, in medical insurance, it's more like we spend, but we don't get anything back. What you're saying is that's actually a good thing to do? Yes, in most insurance, you will, that's true insurance, you rarely get things back. Uh, huh, but, but it's right to invest in it. It's it's very good because when it happens, it just yeah. eats away into all your savings. Uh, mm -hmm. And the chances of medical is a common thing nowadays, you know. So it's just mm -hmm. a very good thing to have. The other thing to remember about uh, um, both medical and is the ways to think about it. In fact, I've never thought about it. And somebody just told me the other day that you take an insurance cover for a small amount, say 50,000. And then you buy what is called a catastrophic insurance, which is about 5 lakhs and up to 15 or 25. Uh, and I think Bajaj sells that in India, where you basically, the small amounts you can kind of cover yourself from your savings. But it's when it hits a certain amount and you've got to figure out what that amount is for yourself. And from that amount onwards, you can buy your insurance. In fact, we end up buying most of the time small medical insurance uh, rather than the big ones, which we actually end up needing for the family and uh, for everybody concerned. So it's a good thing to uh, think about it a bit differently. Most of uh, most of our participants are students who are like uh, just starting off in their careers. Do you think now is a good time for them to get into SIP or even the medical insurance? Would it help to start early or it doesn't matter? So if you start early, you can stop at 45 and you'll still uh, sail all the way up to 60 with the same amount. So it's it's money compounding. So the earlier you start, the earlier you can stop. The later you start, the later you will keep going. So if they start with an SIP pretty early on, they'll kind of, you can stop at 45, 50, you know. And that's when actually your children have grown up and the expenses are larger. And therefore, uh, you kind of have, you know, you don't, your possibility of saving at that point is slightly low. So it's a good thing to start early and then to um, stop early. Anita, I'll stop here and I'll take the questions later. Is that okay? All right. Okay. Uh, oh, there's another question. Somebody they ask now or will I keep it for later? Keep it for later and okay. uh, I'll be happy to take it. I just need a break. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you. sir. Um, okay, so I'm going to hand over the rest of the session to Michelle. Over to you, Michelle. Uh, thank you once again, sir, for taking the time to talk to us and to answer our questions. Uh, so we can take up any more questions uh, on this topic at the end of the next session as well. Uh, so let's move on to the second topic of the day, uh, which is techie traps. So let's face it. Well, we live in an age where the whole world is at the tips of our fingers. Uh, in fact, if we had to take an inventory of our time spent per day on the phone, uh, whether it's for studies or social media or even for work-related groups, it would probably take up uh, more than 50% of our time. Uh, but the question is, uh, do we have control over the media or does the media control us? Uh, so to shed some light on this, we have with us today uh, Pastor Ashish Alawadi, uh, who lives in New Delhi with his wife. Uh, they are a part of Hub Church, and he describes himself as a passionate foodie, a techie, 
and a work in progress. So over to you, sir. Oh, thanks a lot, Michelle. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm here to talk about uh, tech, uh, you know, techie traps. So basically, how to use tech wisely. Uh, I hope my voice is coming through well. Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay, so I'm going to start with like a a, a story, uh, you know, from an ancient uh, book, a series of books that are called the Panchan Santra. And this is basically a story of a Brahmin. And he's kind of, uh, you know, he's acquired a goat for ritual sacrifice and he's walking along a village. And uh, three thieves see that this Brahmin is carrying this goat uh, on his back. Uh, and, you know, they, they kind of devise a plan to how, how they can sort of, uh, you know, get this goat from him. So as the Brahmin uh, walked along the road, one of the thieves met him and said, uh, you know, Brahmin, why, why are you carrying this dog on your shoulder? Isn't it an unclean animal? Uh, and the Brahmin gets angry and he says, you know, can't you see I'm actually carrying a goat? Uh, so the thief replied, he's like, uh, oh, okay, maybe you're right. I must be wrong. Uh, even though it looks like you're carrying a dog. Uh, so after some time, the Brahmin's walking and a, the second thief comes to him and says, oh, Brahmin, why are you carrying this dog on your shoulder? Isn't it, uh, you know, below your dignity uh, to carry uh, such an animal? And the Brahmin again gets angry and he's like, you know, uh, <clears throat> why are you saying that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm carrying a goat? Uh, you you know you must be blind. Uh, this time the Brahmin kind of you know he he kind of worriedly he walks away, but he kind of worriedly glances at the goat on his shoulder and you know uh, but continues walking. Uh, after some time, the third thief passes the Brahmin on the road and he says, uh, "You know, Brahmin, what is wrong with you? How can you carry this dog? Aren't you ashamed? Uh, it's below your dignity." And the Brahmin, you know, at this point he's freaked out and he drops the goat on the ground and he runs away, uh, thinking that you know he must have been seeing uh, this animal wrong. Uh, and that he was actually carrying a goat, uh, actually carrying a dog. So the thieves use this opportunity. They grab the goat. Uh, they have a feast with their family and friends that night. And they laugh, uh, you know, at the foolishness uh, of the Brahmin. So, uh, you know, the moral of the story is basically uh, lies uh, spoken repeatedly often becomes the truth. So uh, the question is for us is like, you know, what lies have we been hearing for so long uh, that they have become the truth? Uh, who is laughing at our foolish, foolishness of calling the truth a lie and a liar truth? And have we la lost sight uh, of the, the narrative of truth uh, while giving in into a false narrative? You know, so today we are looking at what it means to use technology with wisdom, right? You know, the question is, how has technology shaped and conditioned us? How has it caused us to regard certain lies as truths? Uh, you know, what, what role has it played in shaping our society? Has it has a negative effect or has there been a positive effect? And, you know, the primary question is, as Christians, we need to discern how we use it with wisdom, you know. So I would like to kind of start by considering a passage from the first letter of John. Uh, the letters of John, uh, they have a, you know, at their sense, the sense of the letters of John is that they describe the love of God, you know, in a very core, very philosophical, very strong, not only philosophical, but very real way, you know. And um, John himself in the Gospels, uh, you'll see he's described as the one that Jesus loved. And his language is one of love. And he, you know, one of he sees the one who brings out those profound statements like you can't claim to love God, uh, but have hate towards your brother. You know, it's, it's just not possible. But that there's another theme to the letters of John, uh, and that is the theme of truth. So, you know, like in 1 John 4, 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. But many false prophets have gone out into the world. And what, what makes it really interesting is where John begins in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, where it says, you know, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life that was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was the father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the father and his son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So, you know, John begins with truth, the truth about God. You know, they've witnessed him. They've The truth that he has spoken, they've, the promise of this fellowship, uh, with God that they look forward to. And it's not only something that, you know, there's this union with the Father and the Son. Uh, it's not only about, you know, themselves, but it's something that's proclaimed, something to be shared with others. So you must be wondering, you know, why am I talking about uh, about truth? What, what, significance, what is the significance of this? 
what does it have to do with technology and how we use it? Well, coming to technology, you know, uh, the typical understanding of technology is that this is a tool. You know, it's it's something uh, that you can use wisely. Uh, if you use it while, wisely, use it well, you get the most out, out of it. If you use it foolishly, uh, without limit and thought, it will have a negative effect. Uh, now, this the thing is, this is only partially true. Uh, it is important, of course, to use something with care, with wisdom. Uh, but, you know, we need to unpack what does that mean? We need to unpack what technology, you know, what, what does it mean when technology enters the world? So uh, there's a, you know, a, a very uh, amazing thinker from the past. Who's, his name is Neil Postman. Uh, and in his book, uh, Technopoly, he puts it very interestingly. And he talks about what happens when a technology enters the world. And, you know, uh, for those of you who are tech enthusiasts, you may know about, you know, virtual headsets and Apple, which is a very, uh, a very popular company, has launched, you know, one of the virtual headsets uh, in the beginning of this year. And it's it's been doing quite well uh, in terms of sales. So Neil Postman says, technology change, technological change is neither additive or subtractive. It is ecological. And he says, I mean ecological in the same sense as the word is used by environmental scientists. So one, sig one significant change generates total change. So he's saying that if you remove, like for instance, a caterpillar, if you remove it from a given habitat, you're not left with the same environment without a caterpillar. You have a completely new environment where the conditions of survival have now completely changed. Or if you add a caterpillar to an environment, a forest or a place, you know, or a garden, which did not have a caterpillar, the environment has been completely changed. So a new technology does not add or subtract something. It changes everything. So the question we need to ask first is not how we can limit the use of technology so that we create a better world or live a better life. The primary question we need to begin with is, with the new technologies that have entered the world in the last few decades, years, and months, how have our very landscapes changed? You know, how have the rules of condition and conditions of survival changed? How have our ideas about relationships, wealth, consumption, faith, and life itself changed? You know, has it changed in a way that has caused us to move away from God? Has it caused us to distrust our brothers or sisters? You know, has it brought human beings together or has it caused greater polarization? Has it given us new rules for relationships and survivals? You know, has, has it caused us, has it changed the way we see marriage and friendship? How has it shaped our faith? How has it shaped how we see God and what we expect from him? In Matthew 6, 33, Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. You know, I've heard this, I've been, a, I've born in a Christian family. I've heard this verse many times. But there's something like interesting about this passage that I often missed. For Jesus to be a follower, you know, is it's not a matter of adding something to your life or taking away something. It's not only about stopping certain things. It's not about like sin management. Uh, it's about much more than that. It's not about just who you call yourself. The kingdom, it's really about the kingdom. And the kingdom we have, you know, given ourselves to is indicated by what we seek, what we are longing for. Every kingdom has its own laws, informing us what is important and what is not. So the rules and conditions of life are particular to all kingdoms. The way relationships happen, what warrants friendship and what doesn't, how marriage is meant to look and how it isn't, what we should strive for and what is not worth striving for, what we need to give up and what we don't. But Jesus' words, you know, to seek the kingdom are like very amazingly powerful words because they are sort of ahead of the time. And maybe a better way of saying it is that they are applicable to all time. Because in every moment in history, we find dominant kingdoms, the many multiple kingdoms. The kingdom of this world, while having the same label, it manifests itself in many forms. But today's kingdom is shaped by technology, you know, and 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 it has these particular characteristics that I'd like to point out and that I feel defined today. The first is efficiency. You know, one of the, the one of the things that the essential attributes of our world today is about efficiency, delivery apps. You know, today, uh, you know, I can order groceries. Uh, I'm living in, in in most cities, almost every city, and probably in towns as well. Uh, I can order groceries on an app, and it will it will be delivered within ten minutes. Uh, some people claim that it's they've received their items within six minutes. Um, Efficiency, you know, it's a, it's a characteristic of today's kingdom. It's all about getting things done 
uh, in the least amount of time, the least amount of effort. And in the process, the danger is that human beings, we get dehumanized. You know, we become objects. We become uh, something that serves another purpose. Uh, you know, I, I was ordering, I was, I noticed that when I order something on Swiggy, uh, you guys must be using Zomato and Swiggy, uh, you know, uh, the, the delivery agent who moves across the map, uh, he was, you know, usually you see a person there, but in the last few months, I noticed that the person is now a, a item of food or a can of Coke. And I was thinking this is a bit strange that the person delivering no longer is represented by a body. He no longer has hands and legs. Uh, when we when he's late, uh, you know, you can easily complain uh, on the app and get a coupon for your next order. We don't think about the delivery agent as a person, you know, with a life of his own, with a family, children, feelings and goals, trying his best to survive. He's simply part of an application, an app on our phones we use to get orders. So the, the danger is like in looking at what are the consequences of this. A, a major consequence is that people are regarded as important only when they serve a goal. When they don't serve that goal, we should we need to replace them. The second characteristic of uh, of today's kingdom, influenced te te by technology, is that it's all about our persona, how we appear. You know, and this is this isn't something new. It's something you you we've heard about in the last more than the last decade, but it's true now more than ever before. We are defined by how we appear. You know, it's all about the external how we appear to our neighbor, how we look to the by in the thousands of photographs we upload online. And the, the issue is that the inner lives, the longings, the pains, the mistakes, they all become uh, invisible. What is in what is visible, what is seen is our perfect selves. And the danger is that we make our inner, inner lives so invisible that we believe that we are perfect and, and amazing, you know. So the consequence of this is that we we are we, we, we can become people who are in denial and not in touch uh, with our own selves. The fourth thing uh, is all about that uh, today's characteristic of today's uh, of today's kingdom is that it's all about escaping reality. You know, reality is too intense or too boring, so we need to find ourselves another reality. And this is where you know virtual reality comes in. And I would say probably this is the year. Uh, when virtual reality is really going to take off. It's been there for a while. Uh, it's been there, uh, you know, over the years. But I think this is one of the years where it's really going to, it is going to be a massive boom. Uh, as I mentioned about Apple's, you know, Vision Pro headset, uh, it was sold out within the first few days of launch. And the irony is that one of the uh, features of this product uh, is that when you, you, you can be sitting anywhere, you can be sitting in a tiny small room with nothing inside, uh, you can be in a desert, but when you put the VR on, you can be transported to you know amazing places around the world. You could be in a in a forest. You could be in a sea. These these the irony is that these do exist in real life, but now we can bring this experience to any location. We don't have to go there. So the consequence is that reality uh, is can be transformed to suit our mood. You know we won't necessarily face reality in front of us, and finally. Uh, uh, the, the the last characteristic I would like to illustrate is that the goal is the most important thing. Today's kingdom is all about the goal. It doesn't matter how you got got there. You know, you guys, I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, artificial intelligence and automation. And you might have heard about, I'm sure all of you have heard about ChatGPT and that a pastor can go to ChatGPT and actually generate a sermon uh, online, uh, you know, get a, a sermon, a message uh, that is, uh, you know, with really amazing insights and without having meditated, without having going through the struggle uh, of finding, of, of, of you know, you, you, you arrive upon when you meditate on God's word. Uh, children, you know, can do their homework uh, just by uh, getting their essays done by just, you know, getting, putting in text input into the application. And now there's, uh, you know, the, the one of the most popular companies, OpenAI, uh, have developed a program which can generate video you just put text inside and you can generate video that looks realistic as if it's been shot by a camera. So within a short period of time, it may be possible that, you know, artificial intelligence will generate full length movies, whereas where a customer simply goes to Netflix and says, this is the kind of movie I want to watch. And then a tailor made film is generated in minutes or seconds. So the consequence of this is that we don't need to think for ourselves. Uh, we become automated programs. We are, we become the automated programs that we are using. 
So the question is not primarily how we can use technology with moderation, but rather how have we been shaped by the technologies of today? You know, how can we identify these not only around us, but also inside us? And, you know, more importantly, how can we live out the kingdom of God, stepping aside from all that is around us and liberating others into the same? Technology today invites us to escape from reality, while God's kingdom commands us to face reality. You know, that's what Jesus was all about, face reality. You know, call out what is wrong. Call out what is good as well. You know, not, notice what is what is of this kingdom and notice oh, what is that, what is that, that is not. Technology, uh, uh, you know, stops us from being creative. Well, God calls us to have vision and be creative, you know, be artistic, make something new, pioneer. God himself is the creator, you know. Technology makes us disregard people, but for God's kingdom, it's all about loving people. Technology informs us that reality can be whatever we define it to be, but God says that reality is only what God has created and defined it to be. Technology tempts us to live a lie, but God calls us to live in the truth. So, you know, I'm just going to look at 1 John 2.15, and I, I, I like the way the message translates it. 1 John 2.15 says, Don't love the world's ways. Don't love the, love the world's goods. Love of the world shapes you and squeezes out for love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world Wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. So what am I saying? Technology is not evil. You know, I love tech. I love gadgets. And I'm, I'm a big fan of, I'm, I always read the news and see what's the latest thing that's coming out. But the love of technology over God, that is when it becomes evil. Technology is a tool we are, we, are, we are to use for God. It's not meant to be a master that uses us for its own ends. We are meant to shape our tools. Our tools must never be used to shape us. Technology has the ability to shape us to be superficial, unthinking human beings should we be its slaves. But we, if, we are, if we follow in the image of God in being creative, we have the power to shape the tools that we have to advance the kingdom of God, to be a blessing to others. So I'd like to end today, you know, by leaving you with some questions. And these are questions for you to ponder upon. And they may not be something you answer immediately, but there's something that questions that you need to keep asking yourselves. You know, the first question is, how important are people to you? You know, that's something that I, I know I need to keep asking myself. How important are people to me? How valuable are they to me? Often I find that the decisions I make, the choices I make, even in a given moment, you know, to not spend time, to not listen to somebody. Uh, often when my, when my spouse, you know, at the end of the day, uh, my spouse comes and we, my wife comes and she's sharing with me, I'm very quick to pick up a phone and start scrolling and say, yeah, yeah, I'm listening to you. I can hear what you're saying. But the question is, how important are people to you? The second question I would leave with you is, the kingdom of God is all about loving and serving others. So what systems are you creating that demonstrate that your love and service for people is there outside your own family. You know, what are you, what systems are you creating and demonstrating? What are you making that is serving somebody else? Uh, the third question I would leave with you is inspired by Luke 18, 9 to 14. You know, Jesus talks about this two people who enter a temple and they are praying. And one says, you know, thank God I'm not like that tax collector. What a mess he is. And the other tax collector himself says he couldn't even look to heaven he's, and he just cried out and said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a mess. You know, so the question I'm leaving with you is how often have you confronted yourself with the truth of who you are? And the Bible is a is the best benchmark for this. You know, the community, the church community that you are in is the best, best benchmark for this. How do you face confrontation? Do you take it? Do you listen to it? Or do you run away from it? I know me, I'm... I'm when confrontation is there, I'm very quick to run away. But the truth is, God wants us to face ourselves. And the outcome is not to be condemned. The outcome is not to have regret, but the outcome is to have joy and liberation. The fourth question is that, you know, Jesus himself was a person who confronted the powers that were there. 
do we confront the powers that are there in the opportunities that God gives us? And it may be small things. It may be standing up for somebody uh, in your places of work. It may be standing up for what is right uh, when you know that there's something wrong. And it happens in our daily lives. And finally, you know, the last question I would leave you with is, like the Brahmin, have we believed lives ab lies about what we carry because the dominant voices around us say so? Do we can choose to confront those lies with truth? And it requires that we take a step back. You know, uh, there's a lot of noise around us today. There's a lot of voices that are telling us what is important. There's a lot of, uh, when you pick up your phone, there's a lot of messages that are being thrown at you to buy this or to do that uh, or to regard somebody in this way. But the way we confront truth in this way is to first take a step back and say, is this something that goes along with the word? Is this something that God uh, is, saying, is saying that I should believe in? You know, is this something that goes along with the philosophy, with the belief, with the kingdom of Jesus? You know, does it advance the kingdom? So these are the things uh, that I would like to leave with you today uh, in regards to how we should uh, use our technology wisely uh, as followers of God. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Pastor Ashish, for that wonderful session. Uh, the floor is now once again open for questions. Uh, please put them on the chat or you can message I myself. Uh, yeah, I'm going to call. I'll ask her. Uh, yeah, I'll ask her. Yes. Uh, you can message myself or Christine with your queries. Uh, you can also ask any more questions that you have regarding the previous session on finance now as well. Pastor Ashish, I have a question for you. Sure, yeah. Uh, uh, so most of the people in the medical field, right? I mean, like I'm in a mission hospital. So what happens is uh, they're looking at patients and sometimes they're not able to identify. And so they have to be online most of the time to make sure that they're doing the right thing. So if you say like, no, that we have to draw lines, wouldn't that be difficult to do? Well, I think, you know, uh, I mean, of course, I'm not in that uh, field. So it's it, I, you may be the best best, best to answer that. Uh, but I think that my point, as I said, was not to uh, is not that technology itself is evil, but it depends on each circumstance and, you know, what it serves and what your overall goal is. Uh, is your goal to serve God or is your goal to go, goal to serve yourself? You know, and I think that's uh, where the that's the real benchmark. Now, it could be that when you're when you're fully uh, on a mission for God, you're fully doing something, you're listening to his voice, it requires you to be using your gadget to a great extent, uh, you know, that, that or, or you, it causes you to maybe put yourself in a place that you could get addicted to something. Uh, and I think that the main issue is the heart of the matter, uh, which is what is your overall intention and what you're doing. I uh, hope that makes sense. Yes. But here's the other thing. So like if, uh, if, one of us stops using the social media, one of us stops getting online too often, we're going to be isolated from the others, right? So it makes us very, uh, like what you said was very correct, no? so it's like, uh, 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 what you said is correct, we think like the programs, right? But the thing is, if we stop, then how does it work out? It makes us, in, puts us in a soup, doesn't it? Nobody's going to talk yeah. to us. Right. Because we're not yeah, and so then exactly yeah and exactly so that's what i'm saying like it's not about you know completely getting off social media or completely avoiding something it's more about having a perspective that goes beyond that so you may need to use the tools that are there uh, but it's how you are using them and of course in today's world uh, you know you need to be connected in a certain way uh, in some of my work, you know, I, I do work in terms of communication and freelance communication. I have to use the tools that are there uh, if I'm going to reach out to people, if I'm going to connect with people. And I think the point is not to, you know, completely, Jesus doesn't tell us to pull away from the world completely, but to be in the world, in your context, and to kind of, you know, discover what it means to follow God in that context. So really, it's the heart of the matter. It's not about, you know, saying, oh, I'll completely abstain from this, or I'll cut, completely cut off social media. I don't think that's the answer. I think you have to be there 
but you have to also be aware of how it's affecting you and to you know continually take a step back and say, okay, is this helping me to follow God or not? How can I do it in a better way? How can I, uh, you know, limit it in a way that doesn't take me away from people? Uh, you know, I think it's something that we have to keep discovering. I don't think there's a fixed answer for every person uh, and, and for every context. I think it's something that needs to be discovered in each context, what it means to follow God, how to use things in moderation, uh, how to, you know, uh, do some, how to live in a way that serves others and serves God. I have one more question here from someone, uh, from an, uh, one of the participants. What would be the best approach to social media detoxifi detoxification? Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, again, I think that you need to answer that for yourself. But, you know, I think uh, if if you find it, it, it's good to examine and how it's affecting you. So uh, I think that, you know, one of, one of the things I found is that I was browsing a lot of Facebook. I kind of grew up with Facebook because... When I was uh, around 14 or maybe uh, 15, uh, that's when Facebook came and it kind of, so I kind of grew up with the social media world that was there. Uh, but I found that, uh, you know, I was browsing a lot for, for no real meaning. So I thought that maybe that's something that I had to step away from. I think anything that causes you, it's good to examine. One, is it taking you away from spending time with people? Uh, two, is it causing you to compare yourself with people when you wouldn't have done before? Three, is it causing you to, uh, you know, uh, is it is it causing you to uh, have, be more competitive? You know, you have to you have to examine how it's affecting you. Uh, what is it doing to you? Uh, and that's more important uh, than putting a specific time limit or saying that I take get out of this. It's rather more important in how does it help you or how does it not help you in following God in loving people. So it's more about answering for yourself a few questions. You know, put down a few questions. Uh, put down why you are you know, and 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 put down. Uh, whether this is something that is uh, affecting you in a negative way or not. Hope that makes sense. Yeah. Yes, it does. Uh, I'll hand over to uh, Ibrahim. Is, uh, Ibrahim has a question. Dr. Ibrahim, go ahead. Yes. Uh, hello, can you hear me, uh, Pastor Ashish? I have a question from you. Yes. Okay. Uh, let me also turn on the video. I have a few <laughs> friends here. I also want to say hi to them as well. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, thank you for a good talk. Uh, so, Pastor Ashish, I want to ask how important it is uh, for, uh, to have fellowship in person and not have fellowship online. I mean, we are meeting online and you can see, we are, I mean, a lot of people are gathered from all over the world and different places. So how important it is to still maintain an in-person fellowship in our church and in the Christian context? Yeah, I think it's it's really important. I think meeting in person, uh, you know, even from a psychological perspective, uh, it definitely, uh, you know, that the bond that you have, the connection that you have uh, when you're sitting together is very different from when you're sitting online. And, you know, uh, if, if I, maybe a question that for even a Christian psychologist to answer who would answer better than I would. Uh, but it's, we can't help but also notice that the, uh, the you know, the ability to meet online uh, has also opened up a whole world for us. You know, uh, we can, there's, I know there's a few people from here from different countries and we're able to connect and listen to each other in a way that we have never been able to do before. So I think it's, it, it's, it's not that it's wrong to do something like this. I think it's an excellent uh, forum to uh, connect with others, to listen to others, to not have to travel. Uh, you know, it can help us even give us the chance to spend more time with our family because I don't have to do a conference in another country, uh, you know, and spend a, a whole week uh, and then come back and have a whole week of jet lag. Uh, so in some ways it can be very useful. But I think your essential uh, connection, yes, especially with your family, especially with your local church, uh, it's definitely much more beneficial to meet uh, directly, physically, in person, uh, as much as you can. Uh, but there will be opportunities to meet online as well, and I don't think we should uh, cut that out. Uh, so, I mean, another question would be that online service, I mean, if there's a church service, and I can't be present in person, so I can just join online. But this should not be a like a regular routine. I should make an effort to join in person. That's what you're implying. I think it would, I think it's definitely, uh, you know, it's good to look at the effect of how it has 
uh, I know that when you uh, joining uh, online, I know if I was when I was a student, if I if we had Zoom, I would have been very happily joined online, maybe from my bed without putting the video on. And there's definitely a different uh, experience uh, and accountability uh, when you're standing there with people, you're fellowshipping together, worshipping together, and you're praying together. Definitely, it would be more uh, advisable to meet uh, in person and attend a church service in person uh, because you're accountable to each other. You know, you're looking at each other, you're uh, there's a respect of another person's space and an acknowledgement. Um, of course, if you can't do it, uh, I'm, I'm sure that there are certain situations where somebody's sick. And of course, in those things, I don't I don't think there's an issue at all. But of course, it's, it's lovely uh, to fellowship together. You know, it says in the Bible, uh, it's amazing when people come together and fellowship uh, to celebrate God. That coming together is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question, actually one of the participants asking a uh, question for Mr. Matthew Titus, sir. Um, sir, if you can answer, um, he asked that if there's any suggestion on family budget planning or planning for finances during 40s. Really? So if there's any suggestion for family budget planning and number two, planning finances during your 40s. During what? Sorry, I didn't get that. Um. So one of the participants asking. Hello. Yeah. So one of the participants asking that if you have any suggestions for um family budget planning, and okay. the second question is about uh any planning uh finance budget for late forties, finance okay, planning. Okay. okay. Um, I think, uh, so I think in terms of budgeting, I think it's always useful to, um, each, each family's kind of got its own needs at that particular point in time. So other than the basics, which is children, food, education, et cetera, et cetera, I think you run through that and then you see what is left after that and how much of that, what is left can put into a savings. So uh, I think, you know, even uh, like if you saw even that 3,000 rupees uh, for 25 years, so even if you're in your late 40s, you're looking at late 60s, early 70s, you know, when nowadays people are still working and are healthy. So it's it's important to do that. And actually, the amount that they were talking about was a relatively small amount called 3,000, but you can ramp up. So instead of starting at 3,000, you start slightly larger, but do the first year fixed. Don't try and uh, increase the amount in the first year. It's it's just a bit of maths that that formula is talking about. So it's always good to do the first year small and steady. The second year, increase it a bit more. After the third year, you can start dumping money if you're earning money a lot. So it's just that you get a price at a very reasonable price. And then after that, you're making money irrespective of uh, whatever amount you put. Your money is growing quite rapidly. So uh, just follow that design of small amounts in the first year and then build on that, whatever your age is. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's another question um, on the chat. How do we balance saving for our retirement with the Christian's call to give sacrificially? I think um, uh, Ashish also talked about it a bit. I think uh, just as your money comes in, I think you should put the giving uh, portion aside right at the beginning um, and not wait for giving it next month. In fact, I uh, personally recommend, you know, just like you would have a savings fund, put a giving fund aside. And uh, yeah, if you don't have anything to give in this particular month, you can give the next month. But you know the money has been put aside from what you have earned. So it's good to tithe yourself right when the money comes in. And then after that, you calculate on your uh, on your savings. Uh, for the pension side, is the question about pensions, right? Uh, the, the question was for pensions, right? 
like so after retirement acha right so it was a pension so basically uh, the safest way is actually to do what is called a large cap fund for pensions uh those are the blue chips in any country uh they typically are well settled businesses they don't give you outsized returns but at least you don't lose money and uh, i would suggest you go with a fairly large fund house and some of them even have pension funds so uh, in india you have the national pension authority and you can actually open a fund with them if you want uh, and uh, they will oversee your money uh, so that's a dynamic a possibility that somebody else in the government is overseeing your money and thankfully they're not staffed by ias officers they're staffed by the reserve bank of india so the nps is a good place to put your savings in of a pension and now you can actually link your nps account through your bank straight uh, most uh, banks allow that to happen Thank you, sir. Uh, there's another question from uh, one of the participants to uh, Mr. Matthew Titus. Uh, what about fear of losing while investing due to scams? In these days, we can't trust the markets. Yeah, so that's true. And uh, that always hurts a lot more. Uh, but you just um, hold your nerve, like they say. you know the markets can be very volatile which is why if you see that sip thing started with a small amount in the first year and the next year you increase it the third year you increase it even more after the fourth year is when you kind of go all in uh, because then your chances of losing are very low because you have already entered the market at a very early stage so the market will be volatile and there are scamsters abounding but which is why i would suggest that stick with a big fund house like hdfc in india um icici you know things like that uh, the bidlas and the tatas have also got fund houses which actually do a very good job uh, so uh, yeah and just stick with them you know you're sure you won't lose money you might not gain money but you won't lose it it'll come out it'll come back over time but more importantly i think uh, uh it will grow thank you sir there are any more questions for either speaker you can put them on the chat now excuse me i have a question please uh yes to whom uh to mr matthew titus i think it's uh, it's about finance right uh, i was i was going to type it but it's it seems uh it seems so complicated so that, that's why i will be speaking uh the question is about sip uh i was doing i was somehow involved in sip and some of the guys uh when i talked about their opinion regarding sip uh what's their opinion was that rather than saving this uh little amount money for longer time like uh for 20 years i guess so uh if you see the history uh the 1000 uh rupees 20 years back now 1000 rupees now it's the, the number value it's same but their uh you know valuation it's uh, due to the inflation we guess i guess uh it's considered low so uh saving 1 lakh or doing sip now and uh, getting some amount after 20 years i think uh some people say that uh, the value remains the same despite the number seems to be you know vary the number looks uh different in if we see the numerical value but uh due to due to the inflation and the time variation i think uh, the amount will be to some extent it's the same so what's your thought on that i guess this is a very good question um but uh, so if you saw that sip that i had done there was also another line item which said inflation at 7% i think inflation is close to 7 to 9% in india but remember that 
the cost assumption that we make <clears throat> is linked to the price of assets. So whether you buy land, whether you buy gold, whether you buy stocks, these are all assets of different kinds. They also undergo an inflation. So uh, that inflation price is normally built in. But over time, uh, if you get even a 2 to 3% return compounding on your uh, principal amount, that is good enough. You'll be surprised by what you can do with it when you're retired. Uh, because uh, the other prices also move concomitantly. Uh, so while, you know, these are arguments that people uh, make, which are have a merit in them, but they don't have that much merit in them. In fact, I can show you that uh, slide if I can just show it to you. This is the slide. And if you see, there's a inflation assumed rate, 7% uh, over here. This was the old inflation rate in India. Now it's closer to nine, I think. But they say it is seven in India. But assuming it is seven, your real rate of return is actually two. Um, but the trick is what is at the bottom, which is start small in the beginning and then hike it up. This works actually like wonders. It's called the step up SIB. So if you are doing now, whatever your amount, just keep doing that. Don't worry. Next year and the year after that, increase it. Uh, that will work to your benefit. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's another question for uh, about finance. Uh, my question is for Sir Titus. Should we absolutely stay away from debt as popularized by Dave Ramsey? Being in medicine, it's often difficult to keep track of many market fluctuations. Is it a good idea for doctors to be involved in high-risk, high-reward avenues like venture capital or private equity? Besides gold, is silver a good investment as proclaimed by Kiyosaki? This has got many questions. So we started. So what is the, can you repeat the first part? Uh, yes, so should we absolutely stay away from debt as popularized by Dave Ramsey? Um, so remember, Dave Ramsey is talking to an American audience. Um, and Dave Ramsey is talking to an audience which is up to their neck in debt. You know, um, They not only have house loans, they've got car loans, they've got student loans. They're unable to service the loan. So if you actually look at what he's talking about, He's basically saying that don't take debt because you tend to just keep sliding into it. You just keep buying without thinking of the consequences. So if you're thinking of the consequences, I don't think there's anything wrong, especially if you're doing a house. Because in India, none of us really have the ability to buy a house or anything like that. From, uh, you know, by and large, housing is an extremely difficult thing. And the earlier you enter the market, the better it is. So I don't think a house is really worth it. What sometimes get my goat is, you know, I had this young banker from my bank come in to see me and he told me how he had bought this new fancy SUV. And I told him, you know, are, are you a banker or are you like a snake oil salesman? You know, uh, <laughs> because as a banker, the last thing you should be doing is, you know, walking around in all these fancy cars. So, um, in fact, some of the biggest money managers and the richest people they live in uh, their old houses and they drive second-hand cars. Uh, and I've kind of always believed in the merit of having at least uh, one second-hand car because uh, a car is a depreciating asset. The moment you drive out of the showroom, the price falls. That's how sensitive a car price is. Uh, and so it's not an appreciating asset. So as a young person, you don't want to put your money into depreciating assets. You want to put your money into appreciating assets. So housing, car, if you want to buy, buy second hand, do everything is moderate, but put your money aside for savings. So that's one part to it. The second part of the question. Uh, yes. So being in medicine, it's often difficult to keep track of many market fluctuations. So is it a good idea for doctors to be involved in high risk, high reward avenues like venture capital or private equity? So the jury is out really on venture capital and uh, private equity. 
it's not as simple as it looks. And most of the people who are managing that money are managing pension money. Remember, they're not managing money that you need in 10 years. They're managing money that you need in 20 years. And which is why they walk around the way they walk around because they've got to return that money in 20 years time. So that is one part. The second part is that the return on most of this private equity and uh, venture capital uh, is around 9 percent dollar denominated, which is not too bad, but which is actually, you know, people think that you're making huge amounts of money. You know, the huge is an exception. It's not the rule. Everybody is making money at 9 to 12 percent. Even the best private equity guys, even the best VC guys, they're not making much money. It's just that the sums are large and therefore we kind of think they're making tons of money. They're not. Because by the time they factor in costs and all and the amount they return, it's around 9 to 10% in dollar terms. So private equity and venture capital definitely are no-no areas because uh, and I think very few banks really offer that service and they offer it really to the private banking clients. But I would not trust many of these guys with my own money because... I find that they're quite superficial. They follow a herd mentality. And I think the point that uh, Ashish was making really about finance, uh, it applies to finance, is that you know you need to really look at what God has called you to and uh, be away from all of these influences. Because a large fund house, in fact, uh, Warren Buffett, the richest man, he wages a bet that actually if you put money in an index fund, it will do better than many of these hedge fund managers because the riskiest spectrum is what is called hedge funds, which uh, do high frequency trading, uh, which is uh, private equity, venture capital, and then high frequency trading. So it's not that <clears throat> uh, the returns can be outstanding. HFT is, a, is still, the jury is out on what they do. And some of those companies in India and around offer some of those facilities. But I would still say, like you said, you're a doctor. You don't have the time. Stick with an SIP with a large fund house. It will do well. And it will do well after five years. You just watch it. It will be fine after five years. It will keep going up and down a little bit. And uh, it will take care of that. But don't uh, get distracted by it. Because managing these fund managers is equally problematic. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, managing anything else. Um, the final point about gold and silver, I think both are good. Um, silver is uh, supposed to be the metal of the future only because they're making assumptions about it affecting a lot of the components that will be going to artificial intelligence and things like that. So copper and silver are the two elements that offer that. But in this part of the country, I think silver only one fund house offers in India. Uh, everybody else offers a gold ETF, which is the better way to put money aside. Silver, very few people offer. Thank you, sir. So are there any more questions? You can put them on the chat. Uh, there's a question for Pastor Ashish. Uh, so it says that uh, new technology often keeps us paranoid. Uh, for example, UPI has revolutionized our financial systems. However, we often hear RFID chips and cashless societies to be the signs of the end times, uh, where mark of the best uh, of the beast is compulsory to make transactions, and chip implants in the hand is being used as access keys in many facilities. Should Christians always be vigilant and be selective about what technologies they choose to adopt? Um, I think I would agree that we need to be vigilant in any scenario as Christians, as followers of God. Uh, it's very important to <clears throat> think about what we're using and how what effect it has. Uh, in terms of interpreting uh, revelations, uh, you know, the, the things inside your hand and all, I would be careful about uh, being quick to do that uh, because the book of Revelations is a, is quite a mystery and there are many commentators who claim, uh, you know, that this is evil or this is what they are saying. That There was one, uh, I know when I was uh, much younger, when I was growing up, uh, somebody was saying that Bill Gates uh, is the Antichrist 
uh, because of uh, something that was written inside one of the Windows operating systems. So uh, from my my point of view, I would be I wouldn't be quick to uh, call something that is evil or call something that is good in terms of the uh, but unless it's really obviously uh, doing something that is harming people or you know causing something wrong to happen, uh, I wouldn't say it from my side. Uh, at least I'm not a I'm not an expert enough to say that. So I would say, yes, be 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 vigilant, uh, be careful about what you're uh, using. But but in terms of its direct effect, uh, I think we should be careful about how we interpret uh, revel uh, uh, what is written in Revelations uh, today. Uh, because a lot of it is mysterious and a lot of it is something that needs to be really understood uh, and studied uh, before we make a quick conclusion uh, about what could be wrong and what may not what may be right in terms of uh, the way it is written i hope that makes sense thank you yes so if there are no more questions uh, we can wrap up the webinar for today uh, so on behalf of uh, ICMDA South Asia, uh, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Matthew Titus and Pastor Ashish Alaywadi. Uh, we have learned a lot today. Uh, and I also want to thank all of you for taking time to attend this webinar. Uh, so may I request Dr. Rumala to please close in prayer for us. Shall we pray? Father God, as we come before you, Lord, today, we want to thank you for what we have learned. We thank you for Mr. Matthew Titus and Pastor Ashish. Lord, we pray for your blessing on them and your protection over them and their families, Lord. Father, we pray that you will guide us. So many of young people, uh, who, Lord, we pray that you will guide us as how to use our money wisely and how to, uh, to listen to your voice when we decide how uh, the percentage that we are going to use, how much we are going to save, how much we are going to give. Lord, that we will listen to your still small voice and that you, we will be obedient to you, Father. We pray that we will not let technology control us, but we will be able to use it for your kingdom, for the growth of your kingdom. Guide us, Lord. Keep us all under your care, under your protection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.